of our fellows this year um, coming from University of South Florida um, from their neurosurgery program. And uh, we're, we've been honored to have them here as part of our program um, for the last several months. And Jay, without further ado, give us the, uh, the uh, indications for thoracolumbar trauma. Thanks so much, Dr. Mundus. It's good to see everybody back safe and recovered from the weekend. Um, as Dr. Mundus just mentioned, we'll be examining thoracolumbar trauma indications this morning. Um, and welcome to our guest as well. You know, this is a topic that has been discussed multiple times, including in this forum. So we will try to keep it interesting. And one of the ways that we'll be doing that today is by starting at the end with the summary slide. So these are the topics that we're going to examine, um, namely that thoracolumbar trauma is common. The thoracolumbar junction is vulnerable because it's where this stiff kyphotic thoracic spine meets the mobile lordotic lumbar spine. There are a number of classifications that under, inform our understanding and approach. We'll look at a lot of them, but the main ones are the dentist classification that defined three columns of the spine and said that two, uh, injury to two defined instability. McCormick and Gaines then came along with their load sharing classification that examined comminution in particular as a way to predict short segment versus long segment appropriateness for burst fractures. The TLIC score that tried to simplify things and give surgeons a handy pocket tool to um, decide if a fracture was operative or non-operative. And of course, the AO spine classifications and all their iterations. Um, we will be focusing the meat of this discussion on these classifications, examining the history and where they come from uh, prior to taking a look at some of the guidelines for management as well. So let's start at the beginning with thoracolumbar trauma and the relevant anatomy. So it is a unfortunately common occurrence. Um, there are about 160,000 spinal traumas annually in the United States. And some 10 to 30% of those injuries have a concurrent spinal cord injury as well. The majority of these events are, are implicating the cervical and lumbar spine, specifically L3 to 5. Only about 9 to 16% of these injuries occur in the thoracic spine, defined as T1 to T10. And there are about 15 to 20%, however, that occur at this thoracolumbar junction, defined as T11 to L2. Now, this area is accompanied by a much higher rate of spinal cord injuries, around 40%, which makes sense because there's a cord here. Um, and as we mentioned, that this is a particularly vulnerable region. It's a transition zone between a long and stiff kyphotic thoracic spine that's bolstered by the rib cage. Um, and then that zone meets this mobile lordotic lumbar spine. So it's a natural inflection point, a natural area that's susceptible to injury. And the distribution of these injuries does take a bimodal shape. Um, young males are more likely to experience these injuries in the setting of high energy trauma, like motor vehicle collisions and motorcycle collisions. And elderly females who commonly have osteoporosis that may lead to insufficiency or fragility fractures. This is what these bones look like on CT. We've got a smattering of lumbar and thoracic uh, vertebral bodies here that illustrate the body versus the pedicle, the joints, the lamina, and the spinous process, and the transverse process constituting the posterior elements, as well as the costovertebral articulation in the thoracic spine and the disc space in the pedicle viewed here on a sagittal CT. Looking at the anatomy, we won't belabor this point too much. It is kyphotic, but the other kind of key thing to think about is that the facet orientation differs between the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. Specifically, it's they are coronally oriented in the thoracic spine, and this allows the thoracic spine to resist flexion extension movement, limiting movement to only around five degrees, and relatively allowing axial rotation. Not a whole lot, but a little bit more at about eight degrees. Again, because it's stiffer, bolstered by the rib cage, there are fewer fractures in this region, but there is a higher rate of spinal cord injury because, again, there is a cord here. First is the lumbar spine, which has the opposite uh, shape curve. It is lordotic, and the facets are opposite, too. They are more sagittally oriented. 
And so this allows a relatively higher degree of flexion extension movement around 15 degrees and much less axial rotation around two degrees. And there are more fractures at this area. Pertinently, the conus medullaris generally terminates at about the, the caudal one third of L1, but it's always something to check on any imaging just to know where your conus is. That's some of the uh, front matter. Now let's get into the meat um, and see these different classifications that we use to inform our understanding and approach to these injuries. You know, I once had a mentor tell me that anytime there's 10,000 um, answers to one question, it means that none of the answers are particularly good. Um, that is not completely true in this scenario, but it does, the fact that there have been so many classifications over the years does um, allude to this point that classifying these injuries is a bit difficult. So we'll look at a bit of the evolution of that now, and we'll start with the path that took us to three columns. Now, you could argue that this story starts before, and we will be going into some of the history in, in each of these things. So, um, you know, if you're, if anyone else is a, you know, an uns insufferable nerd like me, please let me know. I'm happy to share some of these papers, and they are kind of a delightful read. But uh, this gentleman is Sir Reginald Watson Jones, and he was a very prominent British orthopedic surgeon who in the early 50s rose to become the president of the British Orthopedic Association. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, did this just tickled my fancy, he did describe this one technique in which he would fill a skull defect with a graft harvested locally with a pedicle attached, just showing that ortho and neuro have been collaborating for quite some time. But the scope of our discussion is the spine. So he looked at flexion injuries in the early 30s. One of his first kind of seminal papers was this retrospect retrospective review of about 80 industrial laborers, predominantly coal miners, um, who had developed kyphosis from anterior wedge injuries. And this is this is kind of wild for a trainee like me to to read about and learn about just to see where we've come from, because they, he treated these guys with we'll see some pictures here in a second. It's pretty wild that he treated them with forcible hyperextension and then plaster casting in situ. He did this without anesthesia compared to his predecessor, uh, Robert, um, I think it was Robert Jones, um, who had no, who did use anesthesia, but he saw that it exacerbated pre-existing risks of shock, pulmonary congestion, and pneumonia, and could also let you unfortunately a complete over reduction of the injury given the numbness and in his paper he actually describes it as a quote waste of time because uh the skilled surgeon could do this in 15 to 20 minutes otherwise here's some of the pictures just showing the various techniques he's got other pictures that i won't bore you with where the tables are a little bit closer the shoulders a little bit higher on the second table and he wants to stress just the uh, positioning of these tables and then how he straps the patient down and adds another strap depending if the injury is in a slightly higher location. And he plaster casts them in place. Um, he's very particular about the casting, and then he actually has the patients do these exercises uh, if they have a, a less risky injury for three months. And uh, I was shocked to see the uh, success of his uh, technique. You know, this was a commie needed hyperflexion injury before reduction, and the x-rays don't lie. It, does seem to have largely healed and uh, resorbed in place um, after an appropriate period of reduction in a plaster cast. These are some more examples of success of his technique. In this case, five months after five months of casting, um, and you know he looked at eighty injuries, but the ones of particular interest were the fractured. You mind closing that door? Man. Thanks so much were the ones with fracture dislocations with paraplegia. In these patients, he encouraged emergent reduction in plaster casts for six months. It was just sobering to still see that, you know, there are a number of deaths and not everybody recovered. This is contrasted with the less high-grade injuries that he recommended plaster casting for three months. A few years later, with his, um, you know, cumulative experience, he put out a classification system. This is one of the early um, milestones in our journey, examining how these injuries were classified. He described simple wedge fractures, comminuted fractures, um, 
and dis and fracture dislocation. And uh, this was just one of the first attempts. These are his diagrams, and it shows that some of the ways we think about it have been around for quite some time. In this system, he examined 252 fractures. The most common mechanism, um, primarily for these simple wedge fractures, was, as one might expect, a fall from height. And the classic fracture for the fracture dislocations was the classic mechanism, I should say, for fracture dislocations was the fall of weight on the back of the patient's shoulder, uh, shoulders. Again, these poor coal miners who were the victims of falling roofs. We'll see coal miners a lot in these early papers. Um, his outcomes were reasonable. You know, two thirds of the wedge and comminuted fractures reported that their spines were, quote, as good as they were before they were injured. And some 80% of these patients resumed their original occupations. Again, this is the wedge and comminuted fractures, not the fracture dislocations, which we looked at earlier. Next stop is a, a quick pit stop. This is the, we throw the word chance fracture around a lot. And sometimes today it is used to describe any three column injury. Um, but there's a bit of a historical note here and importance that you know, the original chance fracture is actually not a three column injury, which in today's parlance is of course an unstable fracture. The original chance fracture was a purely bony injury with horizontal splitting of the spine and neural arch. Uh, GQ chance, what a name, right? Was who was a radiologist from Manchester um, described three cases and these patients do not and did not require surgery. Um, this injury was later described as a seatbelt injury in the Americas. All right, so we looked at the three types of injuries from Dr. Watson Jones. Our next stop is someone who would engage in a kind of jovial conflict with him, Dr. E.A. Nickel, another UK-based surgeon who started as a general surgeon, then became an orthopedic surgeon. And again, with the miners, he was invited to study traumatic paraplegia by the Miners Welfare Commission. So kind of a fun aside, he also founded a Travelers Club, which is a tradition that is alive and well today, as we know all too well. It's called Nick's Club, and it selected some, some members from the JBJS editorial board back in the day. But he looked at fractures and defined them as stable and unstable, kind of another a uh, big move in our journey. He added these lateral wedge fractures as opposed to just the anterior wedge fractures, as well as isolated neural arch fractures. We look back at Watson Jones, included neural arch fractures within his categorization, but not in an isolated manner. Um, his treatment for these was interesting. He said no casting. He had them rest for about three to four weeks. His original paper says three. Um, and uh, with limited activities, not bed rest per se, and he found that they healed well. And this is kind of interesting. So Watson Jones would uh, would put up at present at conferences his slides, and he would show pictures of his X-rays, with uh, saying you know the title would be something like three or four months post uh, correction, the Watson Jones method, and then pictures of the patient and the X-rays doing well, and then he would show a slide. Um, pictures of the nickel method, and it would just be a blank slide. <laughs> um, and so then, uh, after that became um, circulated, nickel would come back and do the same. He would show pictures of his results, saying the nickel method with no casting, and then uh, with patients back back in the coal mines uh, pretty soon after the injury, doing well. And then pictures of the uh, he would say pictures of the you know. Uh, Watson Jones method, and it would be a blank slide. So it was kind of a fun back and forth. Um, for these unstable fractures, though, as he did define them, they did require plastic cast, plaster casting, and in some cases, grafting. Now, these are the early days of grafting. So he describes another number of different techniques and does make the note that um, that there are no set or consensus opinion about which technique to fuse these surgically should be used. All right, our next stop is getting closer to the three columns. This is Sir Frank Wilde Holdsworth, um, who is another English orthopedic surgeon. We owe that country a debt, it seems. He started the Department of Orthopedics at Sheffield University. He would go on to also become a president of the British Orthopedic Association 
And he also, at the behest of the Miners Welfare Commission, was asked to study these injuries. His focus was spinal cord injury. But he gave us the two columns explicitly. We already had the vertebral column. It's kind of intuitive. Um, more specifically, the anterior longitudinal ligament. And then he defined and actually coined this term, as far as I can understand, the posterior ligamentous complex that we use all the time today. It comes from this gentleman. It was defined as including the interspinous ligament, the supraspinous ligament, the lateral joint capsules, or the, as we would call them, the facets, and the ligamentum flavum. This is his classic drawing. Um, he described anterior injuries of the vertebral column or the ALL as stable so long as the posterior longitudinal complex was intact. It was as, as a blanket statement. Um, however, if the posterior ligament complex was disrupted, these could be unstable fractures, especially in the setting of anterior injuries. You know, some of his classic drawings demonstrating his thoughts. And then finally, we reached three columns. I, I knew I'd get you there eventually. Um, in addition to the anterior and posterior, he found a middle column. This was Francis Dennis, who actually, assuming I found the right gentleman, uh, just recently passed away in Naples, Florida, after an eight-year struggle with pancreatic cancer. He was quite a fighter. He was originally a Frenchman, went to medical school in Paris, and then moved to the United States for further training and spent the majority of his career at the Twin Cities Spine Center. And he gave us the three column model that has percolated so much and kind of really served as the foundation for much of what we described today in terms of thrash, uh, traumatic injuries to the spine. He did a big study looking at 412 patients and he said that in contrast to our previous gentleman, a ruptured posterior longitude, long ligamentous complex was insufficient for instability in the setting of certain injuries, including flexion, extension, rotation, and shear. He argued that to truly have instable uh, injuries, you also require disruption of the posterior annulus fibrosis and the PLL. And hence, a third and middle column was born. And this is how he originally drew it out in his paper. And just one note on burst fractures, which are, of course, a two-column injury versus the compression fractures. Um, he just, just showed how this three column model will help differentiate these two types of injuries and he further classified these burst fractures in five types and we'll, we'll see this figure again when we look at management as well so that's dennis let's now look at load sharing so after we had dennis's model and around the same time, we started putting screws in pedicles, and it became very popular for a lot of obvious reasons. The advantages of it over hook constructs and wiring constructs, um, which are beyond the scope of this topic, but are a fun read as well. In any case, short segmental fixation, now that we had these strong, uh, biomechanically robust fixation options with pedicle screws, became popular for unstable burst fractures. This is in the 80s and into the 90s as well. But unfortunately, they would sometimes fail. These are pictures showing broken screws and bending of screws um, at, in subsequent follow-up after initial fixation. Notably, the screws on the top in this picture on the right, figure 3A and figure 3B from this paper by Dr. McLean et al., um, they look bent. They look bent at the beginning, too. That's because they actually, as far as I understand reading the paper, they actually bend these rods in situ, but the screws already in place, so that can actually cause the screw to bend. So one kind of wonders if that also impacted the failure of these implants. But nonetheless, you can definitely see a new fracture here and a new bend here. And this led McCormick and Gaines and uh, Dr. Eldon Krakovic uh, to develop the load sharing classification in the early 90s after observing failures of this short segment fixation, specifically in the form of pseudo fusion recurrence of kyphotic deformity, screw bending, and of course, screw fracture. And this concept of load sharing was emphasized. And you know, this is kind of a hindsight 2020, right? They just they decided that if there was no bone with which to share the load, the implants 
uh, would then bear the total load and then would be you know subjected to more stresses and would be more prone to failure. This is the original diagram. They looked at three specific things. One was comminution, how much of the vertebral body fracture was involved, um, or how much of the body was involved in the comminuted fracture, how well opposed the fragments were versus how splayed apart, and then how much, this is this is a little misleading, this is a coronal view um, for, for point C, um, how much uh, deformity was present and um, with scores for each one. And you add them all up and they found that of the 28 patients that they examined, 10 of whom failed with short segment fixation, um, nine of those 10 had a score greater than six. And so they made the point that if your score was greater than six, go long. If your score was less than or equal to six, a short segmental fixation approach may work. This is uh, another diagram from Benzel's most recent edition, just showing the fractures again. It's just a slightly clean drawing, and it shows that that's a coronal thing on the C. All right, Dennis, load sharing. Next is Telix. This looked at morphology, the posterior ligamentous complex, and neurologic status. But first, we had Telis. This was the first attempt, actually, by Vaccaro, Dr. Vaccaro et al., back in 2005 and in this first attempt um, they examined the mechanism of injury as the beginning of their flowchart or algorithm for classifying these injuries then they examined plc and then they examined nerve but after they published this to much aplomb they unfortunately found that surgeons disagreed on the mechanism frequently you know because this mechanism they're trying to determine it by radiographic appearance and that can be difficult and a little bit you know, messy when you get into the weeds of it. And so later that same year, they amended it to the T licks. Um, and they replaced a focus on mechanism with a focus on morphology. And this proved to be much more reliable. This was validated by Kepler at all, uh, at all shortly soon after. And they gave points to the different types of injuries. So looking at injury morphology, we have compression, then burst, then translational, rotational, followed by distraction, kind of increasing severity. Um, with the integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex, again, increasing severity intact versus unsure versus truly injured, um, as well as neurologic status. And uh, just as a backdrop, you know, we're in 2005 now, and in the 80s and 90s, CT scans and MRIs are being invented and also becoming more widespread so we're able to assess these structures with a higher grade of with a greater rate of fidelity um, so that actually enables the development of some of these schemes and then looking at neurologic status intact nerve root cord complete was considered less gray than cord incomplete because arguably there's more to say than the cord incomplete as well as of course catequina um, these are the his diagrams kind of looking at what these fractures look like. And this is interesting because as we progress to the AO spinal classification, some of these original drawings will become more familiar to us as we see what they eventually turn into. This picture I th comes from a you know, radiological assistant website that I think everyone and every trainee I know has Googled at one point and has saved on many of our phones and just summarizes it nicely. Um, but it's just it's a it's a very nice system because it forces you to think about the injury in a systematic way um, and it defines important structures that now may seem obvious to us but at the time we were still figuring out however there are limitations um, sometimes when you look at a fracture it may seem almost intuitive whether it's stable or unstable whether you need surgery or not and when you try to reach for this what I found in my experience and what one of my, my program director once said is that if you're calculating the TLIC score at 2 a.m., it's probably going to be four, <laughs> which then is this gray area within the TLIC score. You're, you're still forced to make a judgment call. From there, we get to um, the comprehensive classification by the AO Spine Foundation. Um, now, AO is, of course, this word that I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, but it's a German 
word for a working group with bone fusion issues. It was originally a Swiss study group founded in 1958. And being a Swiss group, it was founded in Switzerland. They reviewed over 1400 consecutive thoracolumbar injuries and introduced three types um, that are reminiscent of previous systems. A, B, and C, compression, distraction, and rotation. Unfortunately, this needed to find 53 subtypes, and it was hard to use, as a lot of these early attempts are, with poor inter-observer reliability in follow-up studies. But it did serve as a good foundation, and it did serve as a good, you know, kind of setting the bar for the next classification, which is the AO spine um, update to the TLIC score. Um, the thoracolumbar spine uh, classification, system, injury classification system. It also defined the same three basic injury types, and it was much more reliable and easy to use in terms of actually defining the injuries. There's a very nice video on their website by Dr. Vicaro. If you scan that QR code, it should take you to it, um, where he goes through just systematically how to actually define it, and this is what it looks like. First morphology, is it an A, B, or C? Compression with these four subtypes, tension band with these three subtypes, or a displacement or translational injury. Then he examines the neurostatus, the intact, we have a transient, so the radiculopathy, an incomplete cord, a complete cord, or unable to assess. And then these modifiers as well, um, where there's indeterminate injury to the tension band, and then some patient-specific comorbidity. They list a few, ankylosing spondylitis, DISH, rheumatologic conditions, osteoporosis, osteopenia, and then burns or other overlying skin injury to add to the classification of these, of these um, injuries. This was followed up by a other kind of lesser known score, the thoracolumbar AO spine injury score, which just assigned points to these types of injuries that then were used in this next paper to try to develop a surgical algorithm, thoracolumbar AOSIS surgical algorithm, where they used a modified Delphi method, surveyed surgeons from around the world, and found that if the score was three or less, you could do conservative treatment. If the score was six or more, probably need to do surgery. And then both treatment strategies, operative and non-operative, could be considered for the tweeners of four or five. Um, and they examined in some nuance the different types of injuries that could give you a score of four or five and just showed that there was still quite a bit of equipoise regarding these injuries. All right, thanks for sticking with me. We got through these classifications. We got through our tour of the history that showed us how we got to where we are today. And that was kind of what I wanted to focus on. But of course, we can't ignore management strategies. So just to say these real quick, compression fractures are by definition one column fractures. They're stable. And then the stable variants of burst fractures may be managed non-operatively if there is no kyphosis. Surgery is generally indicated for three column injuries, neurodeficit, kyphosis greater than 30, but we'll look at that. And then there's this rule of thumb, this 50-50-20 rule that your trainees like myself talk about a lot at 2 a.m. on call. And then usually performing posterior surgery, that's our workhorse, and you can consider anterior surgery for anterior column support, ventral compression, or severe kyphosis. So let's look at this first. Um, just what we just talked about, the compression fractures are stable, but you do need to get upright standing radiographs and beware excessive kyphosis either at the time of injury or when you bear weight on the injury. Um, it's definitely not something that you want to overlook. Um, thinking about that 30 degree number, there is a kind of a landmark study by Gertzbein et al. with the SRS in 92 that shows significant increase in pain for fractures with greater than 30 degrees of kyphosis treated non-operatively. There's some smattering in the literature and textbooks that this was not always reproduced, however, but it, it has served as a kind of a intuitive and logical um, rule of thumb. Now, looking at intact burst fractures, there are some studies that show that they don't require any bracing at all, not just no surgery, but also no brace. 
Um, this was a study examined that found equivalence in outcomes between TLSO and no orthosis for these type A, AO type A3 burst fractures, where the posterior wall is not um, dramatically involved, more just the M plate, as opposed to the A4 types that include both anterior and posterior vertebral walls. Another study looked at no bracing for neurologically intact burst fractures. This is an older study used the Dennis system that I promised you I'd bring back. And this was interesting. It's a Scandinavian study that showed robust follow up at 27 years and showed a good long term outcome if there was minor or no neurologic deficit. This is, of course, with the caveat that Scandinavians are very healthy people. <laughs> um, so that that takes care of compression and burst fracture and stable burst fractures. Now, looking at surgery indicated for three column injury zone, that's kind of intuitive. Progressive neurologic deficit, that's kind of intuitive. Kyphosis, we examined briefly. Um, let's look at this 50 50 20 rule. The idea here is that if there is 50% canal compromise, 50% anterior vertebral body loss of height and/or greater than 20 degrees of kyphosis, that these are considered uh, traumas that require surgical intervention. And I'm not going to belabor this point, but we usually perform posterior surgery and anterior surgery if indicated. And that's what I got for you today. I appreciate you sticking with me and going through our world tour. And with that, I'll open the floor for any questions. And thanks so much, everybody. Jay, so what do you do at 2 a.m. with a fracture? Oh, I just bug Dr. Mundus and uh, say, hey, we got this guy. What do you think? And um, no, we go from there. So, you know, I, I'll, I reach for Telix. Um, I reach for my 50-50-20 rule. And I look at his neurologic status. Um, and I think between those three, I can usually get a pretty good sense of what is going to be appropriate for this patient. Um, and uh, yeah, it usually fares me pretty well. When you get that four on the T legs, you know, you, I tend to look at the neurologic status. I tend to look at the comminution, reach back towards McCormick and Gaines, and that'll kind of help me advise not just the short versus long, but also how compromised is my anterior column? How likely is this guy to this patient to kife over if I don't um, give him at least some kind of internal brace? And uh, that usually helps me through the weeds. Very good. Thank you. Jay, uh, <clears throat> I, I really enjoyed the uh, presentation. I think we hear you know, uh, trauma classification each, you know, every year throughout, you know, by uh, fellows, by experts, but um, you really did a great job and and I agree that, you know, when you have so many classifications, they might be not good, but you are able to connect the important parts of uh, uh, of the history and putting the important part of each uh, attempt for classification together, connect it together and come up with a uh, final uh, approach. I know that you probably needed more time, but, you know, something within the 30 minutes. Uh, I think you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Barney. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. Hello? Hey. <laughs> you trying to get on, Greg? Oh, we, we can't that? hear you well. You uh, trying to get on? I'm just standing outside a building. Yeah, just in and out. I'm gonna walk around a little bit. Yeah, we can hear you now. We can hear you. Now. Okay. Yeah, so like the one thing that if, you know, that you can tell by your different classifications is the commonalities that exist, which tells you what's actually important, right? Because over time, you've seen this like consolidation of thought, which I think is good. You know, is really broad early on, and then 
now we're kind of getting in the weeds a little bit more, but certainly if you think about neurologic function, that's, that's usually the one that ends up being a little bit more clear, you know, when it, the things that end up being less, a little bit less clear are stuff that's still unpredictable, you know, things like mechanism or even, or even like, um, the subtleties of the fracture morphology itself, where it may seem clear for 80% of the fractures, but then there's that group that, that isn't. And the real gray zone ends up being that group along with those that have like, you know, uh, an intact neurologic structure. And that's where that gray zone will continue until we ultimately hopefully can actually figure it out. Um, but I think you did a great job, Jay. I loved seeing some of the references to the old papers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stop on that note. They get hit by a train. <laughs> Oh, no, maybe we'll have a live case here in a little bit. Please don't let that happen. Uh, hi, Jay. I'm Stan. I'm absent. Oh, thanks so much, guys, for letting me sit in on your meeting this morning. Um, I'm a visiting surgeon from Australia. I thought that was an amazing presentation, Jay. Well done. Putting everything in historical context is um, really important for the management, and um, I think you did a really good job. Thank you so much, sir, and welcome.